So it's really cool that we have all of these listeners and I look forward to sharing my wisdom, my guest wisdom, and a little entertaining here always helps. So I want to introduce my guest today, Elena Ramos Good. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. When I first heard the name of the show, I didn't even read. I just said, yes, 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 yes. Thank <laughs> you. Resonates. Thank you. I know because when we spoke earlier, it was, there was, you know, we talked about it before that there was just this great rapport, vibe, whatever you want to call it. And I loved your energy and I knew you would be great for our listeners. And I, I love what you're doing. I love your story. So I do definitely want to share the story, but I want to let um, the listeners know that who you are a little bit about who you are and then get into the detail. Right now, Elena is starring in Pretty Little Liars, Original Sin. So this is, um, she plays Marjorie. We'll get into her character. So this is taking them back 20 years ago. Yes. A sin that, something, a secret, a sin, um, where you play the parent and you know what the sin is. And it's correct. it's a little bit correct, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've it. been watching it and um, <laughs> it's a little scary. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that it was a little <laughs> scary, but it is. There's like spooky music and everything. And you are so gorgeous. And on the show, they really downplay your looks. And I get it <laughs> based on the, on the character that you play. But, you know, you started in acting nine years old. You were raised by very philanthropic, well-educated attorney parents that taught you that, you know, saving money was important, having your own money, being financially independent was very important, as well as your education. You know, I was raised and raised my daughters the same way. Education is number one, number, yes. number one, and to be financially independent. So it's so important, whether you're a boy or a girl, it's very important. I think boys are taught that more. Always. But you know, always totally girls usually get that lesson the harder way from going true. through bumps in life. I mean, when we talk about the effects of patriarchy and how women relate to money, I think that we are sort of late to the game in terms of feeling like our relationship to our finances is something that is an integral part of self care. Absolutely. And so props to your parents for doing that. You are bilingual. Um, and you went to the LaGuardia Art School, yes. then you went off to FIT, and then you were in a soap opera, and then you got a really big break as playing Dr. Nicole Young. Was it? No. Yes. Were you Dr. Did, Dre's wife. Dr. Yep. Dre's Nicole wife, Young. right, yep. in mm -hmm. Straight Outta Compton. Yes. Um, so let's start with, let's start with how you got involved in this business at nine years old and yeah. what that was all like. like. So it was completely something that happened out of the blue. I was at a museum with my dad. And at the time, essentially all of the public schools that my parents enrolled me in all had funding for arts programs, which was really great. So I always had opportunities to play and paint and perform. So being creative was part of my educational experience. So we were at a museum, born and raised in New York City. So I was lucky enough for my dad to take me to the Met. And I was like, yes. wow, and you know, we're exploring everything and this woman approaches me and she said hey I have um, an agency and I would love for you to come in and audition I of course didn't really understand what she was talking about but it sounded fun and I grabbed my father and I was like dad dad this lady wants me to work for her and he was <laughs> like what <laughs> so I kind of coerced him into meeting her and and they chatted and he took her information and she said listen I have an audition that I want to send your daughter to um, for a pizza commercial and my dad said we're gonna you know do this one thing I'm gonna take you after school he's like I don't want you to get all your hopes up about it right Just have fun and I was like again a kid, I didn't really understand what and that's he meant. perfect, perfect advice from a parent. Just go have fun. This isn't mm -hmm. serious, right? Yeah, that's it. So I go into, you know, this long hallway full of kids and we auditioned. The audition was eating pizza. I mean, how fun is that? <laughs> and I ended up getting the job. And this was at a time where companies put a lot of their sort of budget towards advertising and marketing, and they would throw everything at one commercial because it would run for years and years and years, which right. is very different now. Mm -hmm. So 
I was blessed enough at the time to be able to receive residuals from that job for years, and my parents helped me save it to pay for college. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that was, that was the beginning. And my parents were shocked. And I remember we would have this VHS tape mm -hmm. that said pizza on it. And my mom <laughs> would take it around to like family gatherings and be like, did you see what my daughter did? And I was like, oh my God. Oh, that's so, <laughs> but it's, you know, things aren't like that anymore. Everybody wants to be a star. Everybody's trying to be out there and show what they're all about. And that was back like at an innocent time where we didn't have the internet, people didn't know about things like this. You were just a cute nine-year-old with your dad and she saw something in you and said, hey, I want, let's see if this works. Mm -hmm. And so, and you've always been creative. Did you want to be in front of the camera? Was that something, do you, did you feel like acting was your thing? See, that's a really great question because to be honest, being in front of the camera as myself is something that has never been comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. Being in front of the ca camera as a role, as part of an ensemble, telling a story, that's really comfortable for me. And it's interesting. I never necessarily aspired to be in front of the camera per se. I really love the theatrical community that is around sort of the world of entertainment. Like I love going to LaGuardia High School. I loved the theater community. Everybody has such eccentric, wild personalities and attributes that I'm just, I'm drawn to those kind of people. I would joke with the women that I worked with on the set and I'd be like, you know, like our lives, it's kind of like a traveling circus. And I love that freedom and that sort of unexpected rhythm of life. But the being on camera part of it is actually something that as I became more aware of it later in life, and as we talk about fear, that self-awareness has two sides to it. There's a part of it that can be really fun and I'm sharing and telling a story and that's beautiful. But then there's another part of it that can activate a hyper sense of self-awareness that can make you really Careful. aware of, yeah, how do I sound? How do I look? Is this good enough in terms of what the societal standard of beauty is or what my body looks like? So there's two sides to the being on camera part of it that I've experienced. And so in one way, I'm very drawn to performing, but in another way, there's another aspect of it that sort of, I guess you could say, ignited the shadow side of the work that I've had to do in terms of healing. I, I understand that. I feel similar to that. And maybe that was our connection. You know, when I... I, w I actually dropped a public speaking class when I was in ninth grade because I wanted to throw up every single I, I totally time. get that. Yeah, <laughs> like, totally I wanted that. to throw up. My mom didn't want me to stop. She thought it would be good for me. And I, I went to my guidance counselor. I said, I can't do this. I'm going to vomit. Like I don't, this isn't that important to me. So, and then here I am doing um, bikini shows and getting up in front of thousands and thousands of people in like no clothes, in stripper heels, but I was playing a role. I was yes. playing another character, or at least that's what I had to tell myself before I took a step on the stage and waved to everybody. I was somebody else so that I understand exactly what you're saying. And then you start becoming so well, so self-aware because we, we, we seem to be the kind of people that look deep inside and want to understand why we do this and why we don't do that. And then all of a sudden it, it could, it could paralyze you from going forward. Right. Yes. So yes. the things that I look back and see what I did on social media, I thought, how did I have the balls to do that? <laughs> now I'm right. scared to do it now. Right. Oh, because I didn't know. Right. right. So, there were no, there was no reactions or repercussions. It's kind of like in a way our environment on the positive side can train us to come forward. And I guess you could say on the contrasting negative side, it can also train us to adjust or dim things down in a way so that it goes along with the flow of what society is sort of saying is okay. So you never took any acting lessons prior to that. So when you did that pizza commercial, you you weren't an actress. You no, weren't, no, right. I was just a kid right. eating pizza. <laughs> exactly, and they loved you. And so then, after that, you went you were at you went to LaGuardia High School, which was yes. um, an arts school, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep, and that was where sort of a formal training experience started. And what was really interesting about that is 
When I say formal, I mean formal. I mean, it was Ooh. really traditional Meisner technique. And I was a rebellious teenager. And the rules in that theatrical environment were strict. They really treated you like young professionals. And the goal there was to set you up to go to either conservatory style training, Juilliard, NYU Tisch, these big schools, or to really set you up to start working immediately. And so that was both exhilarating and intimidating. There was a part of me that was like, I want to know everything. And then there was another part of me that was like, don't tell me what to do. Because <laughs> I was, you know, a teenager and I really had that, that push pull inside of me. But the training overall was incredible and wow. very sort of conservatory level, I would say. So you're set, you're set there. You learned so much. You decided to go to FIT because mm -hmm. why it did was you so interesting i remember my teacher mr Yusim from russia very 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 traditional strict um phenomenally talented teacher and he said to me you have to devote your life to this if this is what you want and if you can't make that commitment this is not your path and i was sweating bullets <laughs> i was like commit my life like, like wait i a minute. Wait, wait. yeah like i don't i'm still trying to figure out like how to transfer to the amtrak from you know the, to get out of the city and just explore right, you know right, that was right, a right. big proposition for me and i remember feeling like i watched other students who had no hesitation in jumping in and making that commitment and i felt within myself that I wasn't necessarily in that space. And I wanted to switch from focusing on using myself as my instrument of creativity and work in a different area. And I realized as I was in some of my, my classes and studies, I would sketch a lot. And I loved what my classmates were wearing. There was always a lot of fashion and people expressing themselves with clothes. And I decided to um, apply to go to FIT kind of on a whim. And my mother was excited about that. She said, you know, everyone should have a skill and FIT is going to give you a skill and a trade, no matter mm -hmm. what. You will always be able to translate that into some other avenue if you choose. So I went to FIT and that experience, again, I mean, because it was New York and because it's the fashion industry, full of personality. I mean, I'd right. walk down the hallway and I was like, oh my God, like this is just, again, I was attracted to people, energy, mm -hmm. people's stories. And I think that's the part of me that's attracted to performing, which is right. people and their stories and their energy and being a part of that. So FIT was my college training while my other friends went off to conservatories. So you told me a funny story about that at the end and it was like, okay, now what are you gonna do? Yep. And they went around a room. Tell us that story. So this is interesting. It was another sort of sort of bookend moment like I had with Mr. Yusim at LaGuardia, sort of the head teacher of the fashion department sits all of the senior class down and you have to go one by one and say, where would you like to go? What's your next step? What, what house would you like to intern for? And a lot of people are naming beautiful fashion houses in Italy and have plans to travel. And I started to sweat. And <laughs> as she comes around to me, I just blurted out, I want to be on a soap opera. <laughs> she goes, why have you been here all these years? Yeah, what have you been doing here all these what have years? You been doing? Yeah, everybody yeah. looked at me like, girl, what? And I said, well, you know, you're asking what we dream of and, and where we dream of going for our next chapter. And that's, that's my dream. I love how honest you are with yourself. Yeah, and I and you knew no fear. Well, I was scared because you I were. realized I had completed this amazing program and everybody was going off to work in their chosen field. And here was I yet again, pivoting. <laughs> a little, little different than everybody else. A little different than everybody else. And right. so I did have fear, but I also had that inner knowing that I had to follow that dream. And you probably knew that sometimes when we, when we have those very, very strong guttural instincts and we're good manifestors because we le believe so much in that power of getting there. And it sounds like you had that, maybe weren't aware of it, but you had it because the next thing that happened to you is that you were on soap opera. Yes. So yes. Take us through that. 
So that was incredible because I had grown up watching soap operas, Days of Our Lives, Marlena and John, like anything with a twin or someone coming back to life for revenge. I was like, ah, you know, my mother and I just, you know, she would record soap operas and come home, pop in the VHS. And I just remember, don't touch the TV. You're going to mess up the recording. Like soap operas And and you had to like (laughs) put a different channel on. It was like six or four. Like I, I had my children while I was, well, in college, in, I was in college from 79 to 83. It was Luke and Laura on General oh, Hospital. Yes. And then and then when I had my children, I continued to watch it because I was a stay-at-home mom. I'd be folding laundry while they were taking their naps. And I was watching the soap operas while they were napping. It seemed mm-hmm. so weird right now that that's what <laughs> I was doing. But that's there wasn't social media. There wasn't any no, of this. No, that was the thing. You wanted yes. to keep up on your stories. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and yes. talk to your girlfriends about it. Yeah. So I remember, don't touch the TV, don't touch the VHS until mom gets home. Okay. And so I had always had this feeling of, you know, this is really um, an incredible way of making it, is being a part of that world. And so I had an audition for As the World Turns, and I remember taking the train and being so excited, like, oh, they're shooting in Brooklyn? How cool. And I auditioned, and then I got a call back, and then finally I got the offer for the job, and I remember my agent calling me, and I cried. I called my mom. She cried, and the contract lasted for years, which was amazing. And so that was probably one of, at that time in my career, like a peak kind of experience. Right. Right, right. And they say you get no better training than being on a soap opera because you're taping every single day, right? Every single um, day. I, it reminds you of like what Broadway plays would be, but they come and they go. But this was a soap opera that had been around like since the 50s, I think. Yes, it started as a radio show before TV. Oh, I think I remember really that cool. like in the in the 50s, I think. Yep. Yeah, I think it was one of the oldest soap operas. So then you got your, would you say your big, big break? So your first big break was like at nine and then your next big role. Yeah. That I think the soap opera, it sounds like the soap opera really prepared you for was the role as Dr. Dre's wife. And yeah, and actually in between I remember that, that movie. That that was an amazing experience. In, mm. in between that, I did an independent film in New York City and that was called Elliot Loves. And that Sorry, allowed I forgot to mention me, that. No, 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 that's okay. That allowed me to kind of have a peek into what's the difference between television and what's the difference between film mm. in terms of pace, performance, set culture, because it was very different. What is the difference? It's much slower in film? You can really actually work through one page scene for a day. Whereas in a soap opera, if you're not finished with that page in like 15, 20 minutes, you're already behind schedule. Like you wow. need to nail your blocking and make sure your eye lines are right and move on to the next scene and nail the emotional reality of it and move on. Whereas with a film and this independent film I did, we would have rehearsals. We would sit and talk through, you know, our perspectives of our characters in that moment. And I was like, we have a lot of time. This is great. Like, really? <laughs> like, I mean, why do we need to talk about this? Like, you should know what your emotions should be already. Let's like, you're like, I was moving on, so much go. faster. Yeah. And I was like, this is amazing. So when I moved to Los Angeles and I booked straight out of Compton, I felt like, okay, I understand this is going to be a slower pace. Mm-hmm. The material is going to be, you know, the style of acting is more focused. There's more stillness and also sort of the scale, the level of intensity around drama and the soap opera, you know, things can be a lot bigger, whereas in film you want it to be a, sort of a steadiness, a close to life because the camera is so close to your face and your face is so big on that screen. Really? Yeah. It changes the amount of expression you want to give, which it's, it's a very different style of performing. So one of the things that you said at the beginning when we first started talking is that you weren't necessarily comfortable with being yourself, but you could play a character. But now as you're evolving, are you more comfortable being you, but playing a character? Because part of you, and this is what I've just learned just from interviewing actors and actresses on the show and seeing them, that there's really, there's a big part of you in that character um, regardless of who the char- how different the character is of you. Am I right? 
Yes, I think that's so true because we all pull from experiences we've had, people that we've known, um, things that we've gone through. You know, they're all aspects of you reflected in an entire life of someone else. So there is, of course, a connection between your authentic self and then the role that you're playing. I think that my comfort level with being myself is an evolving relationship because my knowing of who I am is an evolving experience. I think who I thought I was 15 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago changes and has changed. And so my comfort level and my not only acceptance of who I am, but my ability to embrace who I am. I was going to use, I was thinking of the word permission, Mm -hmm. um, just because of how we've talked to each other is that um, allowing yourself to evolve and not, and, and open up that flow of energy to come into your heart and your head. So you can rise to the occasion, be that role that you were hired for with your life experiences and knowing what you have to pull for, obviously, to perform that character. Yeah. And I think that's got to be hard sometimes. Yeah. yeah, it can be. It can be because it's vulnerable. Right. It can and, be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And that's where the fear sometimes comes in. You're like, oh no, I'm being vulnerable. I'm being completely open. Is this going to be painful, hurtful? Like, how am I going to feel? And it's it's hard to be vulnerable. So yes. I... That leads us to what you're doing now. And I, we have to take a quick break. So everybody stay with us. We are going to talk about Pretty Little Liars, Original Sin with Elena Ramos Good. Stick with us. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hello, and we are back on Fearlessly Authentic. I'm Jody Harrison Bauer, and I am here with Elena Ramos Good from... Pretty Little Liars, Original Sin, and I'm so excited to talk to you about this. We've been talking a lot about fear and change and and, and Elena's journey of self-awareness and becoming this amazing actress and now in this amazing series. So tell everybody about this series because before you do, I, you know, I'm almost 62 years old. So this was not Pretty Little Liars, the original when it, not the original Sin, but the original series. Um, I watched a little bit of it, but I'm a scaredy cat. Like I don't like scary movies, but this isn't really scary. So, but it was just, the girls were just too young. I couldn't relate to the, to them, but it was really, really well done. So I, I'm catching up on, on this show that you're on and I love your character. So please explain to everybody what, what this show is about. Yes, so uh, Pretty Little Liars Original Sin is about a group of young girls in high school that inadvertently come together to solve a mystery that began unfolding with their mothers. And so it's all about how this sort of mystery, this sin, is impacting their lives and causing them suffering <laughs> a lot of suffering a lot of suffering There's a lot of suffering and torture yes so yeah. it takes place in 1999 right the so original it sin starts mm-hmm, the original sin occurs then so you'll see sort of flashbacks as the mothers are in high school at that yes. time period mm-hmm. and then fast forward to now their daughters are in high school and the impact of the mother's choices or accidents let's say have on their children now. So all the moms, so when this original sin happened, when this occur, this secret happened in 1999, when you guys were in high school, um, now your daughters are curious to uncover this, right? Because yes. all the moms still live in what's the town? Mill Pound? Millwood. Millwood, yes, Pennsylvania, Millwood. right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's like a blue collar town. Everybody's hardworking. Um, so Tell us about your role because she is complex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as I said at the beginning of the show, Elena is drop dead gorgeous. But if you see her in the show, they really downplay her. Very different. But you still look beautiful. (laughs) um, But I realized that for the character, I was like, oh, okay. Because I saw you and I was like, oh, people don't, they're like, that's you. I'm like, yeah, I really wanted her story to be truthful in regards to what she's struggling with and the essence of what she's struggling with is addiction Mm -hmm. and her experience with addiction and her her perception of it is you know at least in the stages when she's in denial is pain management 
And so she, um, you know, she looks like she's struggling. And I felt like the only way to do that honestly is to show that aspect of her experience physically. And that for me personally was something, you know, because there, there's so much emphasis, I think, especially all of us women feel this on how do we look? How do we look? How do our bodies look? What right. is what does our age look like? And I thought, you know, it was scary for me, to be honest, to say, sit in the makeup chair and say, don't put anything on me. Right. And in fact, you're going to put, you know, lines under the eyes and we're going to, you know, emphasize some hollowness around the cheekbones and, you know, my hair is going to look roughed up. And there was a part of that that was scary, that was vulnerable, but I also thought there's a part of that that's real. And when mm. you don't feel good, you don't look good. And that is part of the story. Right. So whenever you are in a struggle with whether it's addiction or abuse or whatever, it, it does take a toll a on toll. your physical, mental toll on you. Um, I, I had somebody on my show talking about toxic relationships mm. and, and what it does to your body. So mm -hmm. whether it's addiction or abuse or so on and so forth. So how did you, how are you able to understand your role? You play Marjorie, Noah's mom. Mm -hmm. and uh, she's adorable also. She's phenomenal. Maya Rafiko is a little rock star. Adorable. Like you guys look like you belong together. Yeah. Like, you know, the little bit of the relationship that I was able to see, um, you know, I love the way it was played. So how did you prepare for that role to make it I, feel very real to you? Yeah, I did. Um, I definitely did a lot of research on the 12 steps and I really mm -hmm. deepened my understanding of addiction and really how it's just however it shows up for people, it's just a way of managing pain. And so starting there, I really just understood, okay, what for her in her life is painful? What is she covering? And then what does she use to cover that pain? And how does she justify that? Because when you look at it from that perspective, it's really not that hard to relate to addiction at all. Mm -hmm. And I think I can even see how it can show up in ways that we might not necessarily associate as addictive, but any way that we disassociate from our feelings chronically, these are ways in which we're masking or sort of avoiding deeper feelings. And sometimes those feelings are forms of fear, forms of pain. So I did a lot of research and reading about addiction, about the 12 steps. And then I also really understood Marjorie's relationship with Noah as one that's very codependent. Marjorie is not oh, really in a place to play the mother. And so what does that codependent relationship look like? Noah's got to figure out things on her own. Noah's got to take care of her schoolwork on her own. And Noah better not stress Marjorie out because she's already at a 10. So when I understood, okay, that's her perspective of the world, everything is played from that place. Right. So you were sort of, you had your own troubles and you were probably playing an emotionally immature mom. Yes. So you couldn't really be there for your daughter. So you play that role and then your friends, so you're all still friends. So does everybody else, how did the producer of the show, the director of the show create the other women's personalities and how they had changed and how do you all communicate? It was so cool to see um, how different and contrasting all of the women's personalities were. And I think that's one of the aspects that makes the show really watchable is that everyone is very unique and different. So you can relate to different characters' paths. Um, you can see how in high school, Marjorie already struggled a little bit with dabbling in drugs and getting in trouble. And right. you see that with all of the other characters. You know, one character is a little bit more controlling. Another one is a little bit more bossy. Another one is a little more fear-based and avoidant. And you see how cumulatively over time, these characteristics build their personalities. And you see how that can affect how the personalities of their daughters mature and manifest and the inner relationship between the mothers and daughters. So you can really see how certain things are passed on. I love the whole mother-daughter thing. I mean, there's so much strong female energy that I think when you're watching the show could remind you of a relationship that you might have a part of your relationship that you might have with your mom. Obviously this is fiction. So, you know, but it's still relatable, I think, to women and moms of any age yes. that that can relate to having maybe the, their mom seeing some of their mom or their daughter in the character. So what attracted you to this role? Because there, I know there are a lot of female 
so most of the cast is female. So predominantly yes. it's a female cast. Yes. You know, the men are kind of like the sidekick. Yes. And right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um and then the, a lot of and the I love producers. the way you said that because I'm so used to being the sidekick. I think women in general in entertainment talk about this a lot, that yes. now that's changing. Women are usually sort of the supporting or behind the scenes story right. or part of the male story. And this is the reverse. The men are supporting and behind the scenes a little bit for the dominating female story. Line. I saw that like very, very clearly. It was very, very clear from the beginning of the show. So is that one of the things that attracted you to this role? A hundred percent. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, um, you know, we, we tend to expect, I think, because we're used to the media that we consume, that the storyline is going to center around a male somehow. Mm -hmm. And then the female characters are in reaction to that male storyline. And this was right. the absolute opposite, right? All of these women are in reaction to each other. They have their own unique journeys. Um, and their stories are not about necessarily one linear path of how their romantic relationship is, which I think often happens. Yeah. These are all about their relationships with, you know, their friends, their children. And one of the things that was so interesting to me is how everyone had a different story to tell. Everyone has sort of a victim element or a villain element or a victorious element. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many different female roles that you have room for all of these different archetypes. And I felt like there were a so lot exciting. of, I felt like there were a lot of villains. Yeah. Well, yes. I, think <laughs> I felt like, I felt totally like, oh, right. a lot of villains like, in these this. are some bad girls. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, lots of villains, but it was female villains. So I thought that was also empowering. I mean, not that I'm out there going, okay, ladies, go be villains, but mm -hmm. it's fun. I mean, every woman I've ever interviewed that played the villain loved oh, that sick. role because it's yes. so different usually from who they really are. Again, not being who you are, but taking part of your personality and putting it in there. Was there any fear in taking on this role? Yes. And I think it touches upon sort of that fear of uh, taking off the makeup. Mm. How is this going to look? Stripping things way down with my posture, with my energy, everything. And how that would be perceived or received, I think that was a little bit of fear. I think, you know, it was exciting for me as an artist to take that risk because I feel like a lot of men, especially in the entertainment industry, are really sort of not only encouraged but celebrated for yes. being raw and letting themselves dive into a character physically. But women, while we can speak to some notable ones like Shalise Theron, you know, in Monster mm -hmm. and... Um, uh, Halle Berry recently in the film she starred in called Bruised, you know, they've been celebrated for being really raw and, and, um, sort of unfiltered in many ways, but I would say that's not typical. I would say right. that's not what we're used to. I so agree. I think for me, I was excited to go there, but I also was scared. I did notice when you said your energy, bringing your energy down. And as an actress, I'm sure that's what you're used to do. And you, you know how to play that role, even though it's different. But I did notice that was the other thing I did. I had to take a double take. And I was like, is that Elena? Mm -hmm. And then you were like, so mellow. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm because of the character that you played, but I'm, I'm excited to, to watch the whole series, even though for me, the music is really scary. It's spooky. so scary. It's totally I'm so spooky. glad it's you're saying slasher. that. No, it is. It is very spooky. Like even for me, I don't watch it super, super late. Cause I'm like, oh, I'm going to have nightmares, even though I know, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> right. So Rachel, who's doing the sound right now, as she's 21 years old, she said she watched Pretty Little Liars. Shout out to Rachel. And how is this different? So if somebody's familiar with the original show and now this Pretty Little Liars original sin, what is the difference? It's just that the it- The biggest difference is the slasher genre element. You okay. Know, really emphasizing that. And there's all these amazing references to really classic films like It. You know, there's a lot of tie-ins to that and inspiration from things like Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, there's all of that in there. Even some aspects of um, Pet Cemetery. You know, there's these different classic movies that they reference. So the entire style and genre of it is one of the biggest differences. Mm, okay, thank you for sharing that. I was trying to think about where was I in 1999, okay? 
And I was like, okay, I'm 38. I have two children. I'm married. And it's just like, no, I wouldn't have been watching that because we were no. watching like Barney <laughs> and Sesame Street and all Aww. of those other things and yes. listening to the Spice Girls, I think, if I've got yes. the right decade, right? <laughs> yes. So it's just so as we talk about women, women empowering women, I know you're an advocate for that. I'm an advocate for that. Stepping outside of your comfort zone, all of the things that we hear, but are harder to do than they are to say. How do you, I know women like Reese Witherspoon are taking very, very big roles in Hollywood now. How do you feel how the roles of women are changing as producers, directors, and so on? It's such a wonderful question, and I think it's really the topic of the moment, because mm. as women, we make up half the world, but we don't make up half the workplace, and we certainly don't make up half the voices in entertainment. So there has been historically a huge gap where we just don't see ourselves outside of being on someone's arm, a sex symbol, or right. just a whisper or a moment, not a full character, but just a breath of a person on, on camera, and that's really changing right now. And you referenced Reese Witherspoon and there's so many amazing women right now that I think are coming forward as producers, showrunners, content creators, and writers that are filling in the gaps that we've all been accustomed to seeing meaning not seeing ourselves and now that's really starting to change and being a part of this show for me it was the first time i've ever worked with so many female directors nine out of ten of the episodes were directed wow. by women. i kept waiting to see a man's name in at the beginning of the show and like there was like maybe one or two <laughs> one. and i thought Roberto. yes so greater yeah it was amazing and i remember you know we have so many different generations of actors on set women and i remember looking at some of my castmates and we would go can you believe and we'd go, no, this is just amazing. I mean, it's so cool. It's so cool. And it's, you know, you kind of think about where we are. It's 2000 and, you know, whatever, right? What yeah. year is it? 22. 22, right. But we are just on the precipice now of these doors being opened and staying open rather than having a flash in the pan trend where I think that has happened a little bit here and there mm -hmm. over the last decade. But now I think we're at a moment of critical mass where people are getting in the door and women are really able to stay there and make their mark in the industry. And I think it's going to have a positive effect on younger generations. I do too. And do you see yourself getting behind the camera at all? You know, if you would have asked me that question 10 years ago or 20 years ago, the only reason why I would have said no is because I never would have seen an example of that being possible. And mm -hmm. now my answer is yes, because not only do I see it as possible, but I see it as something that's inviting and fun because I've seen writers rooms full of women sharing their authentic voices. And I think to myself, that is a path I would love to take. Should it be my path at some point? Why not? So what's next for you now? You've, you've wrapped this up. What, what, what's next for you? I'm so excited for what's on the horizon. We are definitely going to be hearing about what's happening for season two. Ooh, so yay. I can't say much about that, but I'm really excited because that, that will be um, revealed soon. And I've been really, really busy working on some things that I can't talk about yet. Okay. But yeah, but I'm excited. I'm really excited for what's on the horizon, not only for myself, but for literally where we are right now at this moment in time in history. I think we're in a really good place, even though I think that there's more um, we need to overcome and more doors that need to open up, I think we're in a really beautiful moment where there's a lot of positive momentum happening. And so I'm I, excited I, for the I future. I feel that. I feel that that shift in the universe. And I think that if we manifest it, it will come to us. Yes. So you, your whole life, you've basically been working on what's next for Elena. What's next? Not, not selfishly, but what's next for me? What else can I do? And so how do you take care of yourself, your well-being, your mental well-being, your fitness? When I say fitness, you know, health and, and body, mind and body well-being. I love that question and it's so funny. The answer is in your question. I was so focused on what's next. The way that I take care of myself is being focused on what's right now. Mm -hmm. Is this moment that we're having here together, one of the ways that I take care of myself the most is by being present. Because I used to be so caught up in what's happening tomorrow 
what happened yesterday, how can I tie those two things together to get to that next step, that next year, that next goal. And I also realized that in that loop, I became very anxious. And through that, I started to discover practices that really allowed me to center myself and become more and more and more present. So one of the biggest ways that I take care of myself and replenish and recharge is by meditating. That is something that I have always had to work on because it is so hard to stay still. And for somebody like you, who's so creative, and I'm sure it's so hard for your your brain to just shut off from the regular world and to sit still. I know I have a hard time with it, but it is a practice. And journaling, I like. I tend to like to journal more than I like to sit still because I. I I don't know if I have ADD, but it's just, it's hard, but I think we always have to be still with our thoughts. And I think that can lead to more creativity. Yeah. Yeah. And it can also lead to an ability to let go. I think I used to felt like everything that I accomplished, I have to manifest it myself. And there's a part of me that would just get burnt out. And I realized through my meditation practice that I can lean on stillness and lean on a sense of trust that all is going to unfold as it's meant to for the highest good. And I also started to realize that for me, recharging was getting outside of myself and seeing how I could show up better for other people around me. How, how do you I do that? Service. I like to walk dogs. I like to volunteer and walk dogs. I love to teach meditation. I love talking about speaking about fear. I love talking about anxiety and how I can show up and offer people meditation practices or simply emotional emotional support that are going through experiences of anxiety because one, it reminds that person that they're not alone, but it also reminds me that I'm not. So for me, taking care of my practice, but also taking care of the people around me by being of service has been really, really recharging. I think that after COVID and everything that happened with that, was your, during that time, were you, were, was everything on hold for you or were you still oh, no, busy working? A, no, it was a very big pause. It was a mm. very big pause. And I did you think, welcome that or did it scare Oh you? no, I was like, this is terrifying. What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, it really took me a while to get to exactly what you just said, to being able to welcome in the pause. And I thought it was really ironic because I had finished yoga teacher training and I had done really extensive meditation. So you would think, oh girl, you're ready for this big pause. No, it was terrifying. I had the tools to sort of work work with what came up for me, but that didn't mean it was easy. It just meant that it was a challenge and I had to apply those tools on a regular basis because the industry was crickets. And I really had to start letting go of, as we talked about what's next. And I allowed myself to have a blank slate because for so long, none of us knew what was next. Right. And so it was a scary time. I was actually, I loved being in, in quarantine because I got to work out when I wanted to work out. Oh. I wasn't running to my fitness studio. I, I Everything was still. And actually, that's when I launched this show wow. was during COVID was oh. in May of 2020. So I loved it. And my husband and I talk about it all the time. We're like, oh, we loved being in quarantine. <laughs> so, But th- what made me anxious was getting back to the real world. Yes. And then everything went from zero to 100. And then, and I feel like it's still speeding along like that. I think you just nailed it. I think you just nailed it. We went from stillness, which once, you know, I I think there were so many people that manifested amazing creative things like your show. That's such a good example because you had the space to manifest that. And now we're at a thousand miles per hour and it's like... (sighs) It's too much for me. I don't know yeah. about you, but it's a little too much for me. So I I do try to find the stillness and I love being present because to in my opinion, that's the only way to be. You have to be present. You can't be, I, I couldn't be talking to you and having this great conversation if I'm thinking about something else. Mm-hmm. So we're almost done with the show. We have oh. a couple of minutes left. I know this has just been an amazing <laughs> time so talking fun. to you. And um, a question that I like to ask my guests is, what does it mean for you to live a fearlessly authentic life? For me, living a fearlessly authentic life means living from the heart. 
however that shows up for you in the present moment is connecting to that energy that we all have within our hearts and acting, speaking, and giving from that place. Beautiful. I, I love I love that answer. How can our listeners get in touch with you and give them every inf- little bit of information they need to watch the show, get in touch with you, follow you and everything? Yes, absolutely. So Pretty Little Liars Original Sin, the whole entire episode is now available. You can stream one through 10 on HBO Max. And if you'd love to check me out, send me a message, say hello. You can follow me on Instagram at Elena, E-L-E-N-A, Ramos, R-A-M-O-S, God, G-O-O-D-E. You say it much prettier than I do. (laughs) Elena, thank you so much for sharing so much with our listeners. And I I can't wait to watch the show. I might have to close my eyes a few times. Yes, definitely. But other than that, I love talking to you and I hope that we can stay connected. So thank you for your time. Me too. It's been a joy to be here, Jody. Thank you. Thank you. And for everybody else, I hope to see you, talk to you next week. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention... Um, you can also catch me on YouTube at Jody Harrison Bauer and follow me on Instagram at Jody. Everything is at Jody Harrison Bauer, but YouTube, so you can see me interviewing my wonderful guests. So don't forget about that. And so until next time, go out there and be fearlessly authentic. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you next week. <laughs>